The Order 1886 was one of the few exclusive games announced when Sony first presented the PlayStation 4 at E3 2013. At the time, it caused a bit of a stir. It was an original concept with next-gen visuals and a strong premise. I mean, steampunk knights fighting werewolves, what's not to love? However, when the game was released two years later, it received okay reviews and basically faded into obscurity. During quarantine, I've had time to play more games and picked it up at a discount. I didn't have high expectations, but it's a cover-based shooter, so I assumed the gameplay would be serviceable enough. And did I mention? Steampunk knights fighting werewolves. How bad could it be? The Order 1886 is not about steampunk knights fighting werewolves. It's about an immortal super cop who uses military-grade munitions to suppress a disenfranchised, impoverished underclass. Yikes. It would be incorrect to say this game has aged poorly. This was as much a bad take when it was released as it is today. But playing this game in 2020, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests and a worldwide conversation about the role of police, makes the experience especially... <sighs> okay, let's unpack this. The Knights of the Round Table, also called The Order, was founded by King Arthur to protect Great Britain from a race of mutant shapeshifters called half-breeds, that is, werewolves or lichens. In 1886, the Order continues the fight, now armed with assault rifles, arc guns, airships, and all manner of technological marvels. They also have the Black Water, an elixir produced by the Holy Grail, which cures their wounds, makes them stronger, and extends their lifespans by centuries. You play as Grayson, codename Sir Galahad, gruff and serious, but a well-respected veteran and certainly not hiding any deeply suppressed rage. Your first mission is to dispel a group of bedlamites, mental patients who have escaped from some institution and are causing havoc in Grosvenor Square. And the only way Galahad can think of to deal with this is to grab a big gun. We may be pursuing bedlamites, but they remain civilians. Use non-lethal force whenever possible. Understood. Um, remind me which is the button for non-lethal force? Escape me down! Do I have to kill them? I do. Okay. <laughs> you might be wondering why these bedlamites are a concern for the Order. Don't they have some werewolves to shoot somewhere? Well, you see, there's this rebellion an organised militia with anti-imperial sentiments, and your commander Percival suspects they might have had something to do with the Bedlamites' escape. Bedlamites running amok. Percival thinks it could be a rebel subterfuge. Okay, but still, the rebels aren't werewolves either. Ah yes, but the civil unrest the rebels have been stirring is encouraging werewolf activity, or so the Lord Chancellor believes. The rebellion. As long as its campaign of anarchy and terror is allowed to continue. The plague of lichen infestation that has infected our city will only grow more intolerable. There's no real evidence the rebels are directly affiliated with the werewolves, but the fact there seems to be some correlation between rebel and werewolf activity makes them just as bad in the eyes of the Order. Killing rebels is the same as killing werewolves, and killing bedlamites is the same as killing rebels. Oh, but what luck? Turns out some of the Bedlamites are werewolves. One of the rescuing pieces are half -breed. Make that more than one. So I guess the massacre was worth it. Once the threat has been dealt with, Sir Percival wants to launch an investigation into Whitechapel after finding this hospital tag among the Bedlamites. Whitechapel happens to be where the rebels operate from. Percival believes this proves a connection between Bedlamites, rebels, and half-breeds. But the Lord Chancellor opposes. Whitechapel is a matter for the civil authorities. He, quite rightly, points out fighting the rebellion is not within the Order's remit. For some reason, this doesn't settle the matter, so it's put to a vote. Aye! Or nay! Nay! Uh, guys, if you all talk over each other like that, I can't count how many- The nays have it! Well, all right then. But Percival isn't about to let pesky bureaucracy get in the way of his plans. 
so he sends Galahad and the team on a secret operation into Whitechapel. You arrive under cover of darkness and, for some reason, attack a man in the street? Oi! Because only rebels wear red scarves, I guess? And bollocks to discretion? Anyway, to your complete astonishment, some of the locals take exception to you being there, and suddenly you're in a massive gunfight. So Galahad decides to call in air support. Air Command, this is Galahad. Thank you, Monsieur. Monsieur Copy. We are without sanction here. The Lord Chancellor will be most displeased. We'll worry about that later. Um, could we worry about it now, actually? You locate the hospital the Bedlamites escaped from, and discover everyone inside has been massacred by werewolves. You even do your job and fight one for a bit. But never mind that. The important thing is there's this ward the rebels have been using as a hideout to plan an assassination. The target? Lord Hastings, peer of the council and chair of the United India Company, who's literally just boarded a flight to the Americas on his new flagship, the Agamemnon. For all we know, the guard detail could have been infiltrated by the conspirators. We need to unravel this without arousing suspicion. The council should at least be apprised of this situation. We don't have the luxury of seeking the council's permission. We're getting aboard that ship. I guess the werewolves can wait then. The gang sneaks aboard the airship, planning to discreetly commandeer it. Rules of engagement, monsieur? Do what you must. We don't have time to distinguish between rebel conspirators and the company guards. Remember, stealth mode. We don't know which of the guards are rebel infiltrators and which are normal, innocent guards. And since this is another unsanctioned operation, we don't need more unnecessary blood. Maintaining stealth is imperative. We just encountered resistance from company guards. They are using deadly force. Reciprocate if necessary. Jesus, Percival, what did you do? It's only been five minutes. Galahad was actually behaving himself for once. He's only encountered one guard, so he cleverly distracted him to harmlessly knock him out and Galahad, no! Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, not again! Oh, oh, Galahad. You need to gain control of the cockpit, quietly. <laughs> once the ship is under your control, Galahad sets up a sniper point in the ballroom to protect Lord Hastings. The rebels are using stolen company uniforms. They'll be dressed as guards. Guards without proper insignias. Oh, so it's actually fairly straightforward to tell the difference. Didn't take you that long once you actually looked at them, did it, Galahad? Rebels! Get him out of there! You save Hastings and evacuate the passengers, but the rebels blow up the ship, sending Galahad and Percival down with it. Galahad survives, Percival doesn't, and oh boy, Galahad does not take it well. So when the rebels attack Lord Hastings again, right outside the palace, Galahad takes the opportunity to go on a jolly old murder spree. Gray, where are you going? This is no time for vengeance! Come to your senses! The royal army is en route. They will contain the threat from here. The knight commander has requested that you abandon the suit. Christ, Ignoring all these pleas, he murders until he runs out of bullets for his electric bazooka, and even then resorts to using his fist. Where's the Indian woman? Right, the Indian woman. So, Galahad has become obsessed with this rebel woman he keeps bumping into. In Whitechapel, in the hospital, on the airship. And because they've shared some meaningful eye contact, I guess, he's become convinced that she's the mastermind behind the whole operation. Where is she? Tell me! Whitechapel... Brothel... Galahad goes back to Whitechapel, punches a bouncer, steals a drink... A drink, goddamn you! ...gets hammered and confronts the woman. So much animosity. But it turns out the woman is not the leader of the rebels. This other, very similar woman is. I am the one you seek, not her. Lakshmi Bai is surprisingly accommodating. She answers Galahad's questions, even though he doesn't like the answers. Do you deny the attempt to kill Lord Hastings? He deserves to die, along with every one of his collaborators. Rantings of a fanatic! You are an empire of bootlickers groveling at the feet of the mighty United India Company. 
God, your tongue, woman! We are more alike than you think. We have nothing in common! Do not allow your friend who have died in vain! Enough! Jeez, such drama queens. Anyway, Lakshmi takes Galahad to the Blackwell docks, claiming she can show him proof of the United India Company's misdeeds. Be prepared to meet heavy resistance from the United India Guards. Until I say otherwise, we will not harm innocent men. Ha! That's rich. I guess killing hired security doesn't give Galahad the same thrill as murdering poor people or the mentally ill. And yet, when they're inevitably spotted almost immediately, he doesn't take much convincing. I'm just numb to it now. The proof, it turns out, is a shipment of cargo bound for the Americas. And what's in the box? Vampires. It can't be. Hold up, time out for a second. Vampires are a thing in this game? Yeah, they're half-breeds. I thought werewolves were half-breeds. They are. And so are vampires. You know, this game's about supernatural monsters and stuff. Okay, but I don't have any context for this. Are vampires a big deal? Look, vampires are a thing, they've always been a thing, and yes, they're a huge deal, so just shut up and grab the gasoline. So you burn all the vampires, which thwarts the company's plans, but also destroys all the evidence. The Lord Chancellor will hear none of it. I refuse to believe it. So instead, Galahad tries to convince the Lord Chancellor's son, Sir Lucan, by doing what he does best, an illegal stealth mission, which quickly devolves into violence. Bracer. I think it's unwise to eliminate company guards until we have proof. There is no time, Alistair. Why is that always the excuse? They've infiltrated the company headquarters in search of more evidence, and for some reason, Galahad invited Lakshmi along as well, but didn't think to warn Sir Lucan she was coming. Look and hold your fire! She is your confederate. Have you taken leave of your senses, man? I might ask the same question. What was your plan here, Galahad? The argument blows their cover, and of course, a huge firefight ensues. So you kill everyone and search for the evidence, but instead you find a naked old vampire killing off a tertiary character. Surprise, surprise, the vampire is Lord Hastings, who is also... Jack the Ripper, at your service. Yep, he's in this game, and he knew you were coming because Sir Lucan told him. Alistair, how could you? Forgive me, brother. I have to look to my own kind above all. Sir Lucan? More like Sir Lycan? Lakshmi escapes, but Galahad is arrested. And since Galahad's been a bit of a dick lately, every single one of his friends turns against him. Guilty. 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 Galahad is stripped of his rank and sentenced to death. It gets kind of boring after this, but basically, Galahad escapes the dungeon, nearly dies, but the rebels nurse him back to health, so he goes back to the palace to face Sir Lucan once again. You'll have to use all the skills you've learned to overcome the quick time events to defeat him. The Lord Chancellor turns up and reveals he always knew his son was a werewolf. He wants to keep it a secret, but realises Lucan can't be allowed to live. He asks Galahad to kill him, which Galahad does. And that's the end. Lord Hastings is still at large. Your friends still think you're a traitor. The company is still shipping out vampires across the globe. But presumably, all of these things will be tied up in the sequel that the post credit scene is really pushing for. I'm Galahad. No more. If that plot summary left you with any questions, all I can say is, you and me both. A big problem that's going to come up a few times is how the game fumbles to communicate important information. For example, I played through the entire game without realising the knights are immortal. And that's not because the game never explains this, the Lord Chancellor spells it out quite clearly. The elixir which heals all wounds and extends the life of natural men. But this is halfway through the game, and it's one brief mention sandwiched in a eulogy for an important character who's just died. My attention was not focused on the implications of this offhand remark. There are other references to the knight's longevity, but this is either reminiscing about the impossibly distant past, which, in an alternate history, is never clear they're referencing real history I'm supposed to recognise, or it's banter about being old. But since they all look old, this doesn't immediately convey counting their ages in centuries. Slowed ageing is a bit harder to communicate than simple immortality, but they never properly sit you down and explain it to you. 
Normally I prefer fantasy stories to avoid conspicuous exposition, instead allowing its audience to intuit these details from implication and context. I think this is what the order is going for, but it doesn't make it easy. It is needlessly drawn to complexity. It doesn't help, for instance, that all the knights have multiple names, usually a title, a real name, and a nickname, which the game haphazardly freewheels between, expecting you to figure it out for yourself. In a similar vein, most of the key characters have some sort of hidden agenda. Your allies are secret enemies, your enemies are secret allies, and some characters are just… undefined. Percival is very inconsistent. At times he seems to favour restraint, Marquis. Nous ne chassons pas des Anglais sur le nouveau continent. Votre témérité sera requis à un moment opportun. Other times he argues he should be able to act with impunity. When the noble Arthur sought to contest for truage with the Roman Emperor Lucius, he did not trouble himself with issues of jurisdiction. And it's never clearly explained what his intentions are. On two occasions, you spot him having a shifty conversation with a mysterious old man. Strange. But the game never sees fit to pay off whatever this is setting up. Galahad confronts Percival about it, but for some reason he decides the opportune moment is in the middle of commandeering an airship. Sebastian, I must ask you, who is the old man you are talking to on Mayfair and Whitechapel? Since it's not the best time, Percival evades the question. It's a long story, one that I will share with you when the time is right. No rush, I'm sure that conversation will happen. This is never mentioned again. I think the implication is the mysterious old man is connected to the rebels somehow, since it's he who rescues Galahad from the Thames, although I didn't clock this was the same guy until I read it on the wiki. But apart from this, the game drops several hints that Percival is a rebel sympathiser. No one is immune from the rebels' influence. Surely the Lord Chancellor does not mean to question Sir Percival's loyalty. And before the airship is destroyed, Percival attempts to reason with the rebels. Listen to me, lad. Stand down. Nevertheless, he's also dogged in his pursuit of them. He justifies slaughtering Bedlamites on the mere suspicion of rebel involvement, and mounts an illegal operation into rebel territory on pure supposition, even though he doesn't believe they're the real enemy. You really believe the rebels are collaborating with the half-breeds? The Lord Chancellor is convinced of it. I have my doubts. So how come the Lord Chancellor opposes this investigation, while Percival wants it so badly he'll do it illegally? Shouldn't it be the other way round? It's not clear how much of the truth Percival knew or when he knew it, but by the end he does seem to be aware of the company's true plans. No, not as long as the company is allowed to carry on and obstruct it. They won't. We'll see to it. So why is he here? Why try prevent the destruction of the airship? All the passengers have been evacuated by this point. He even had the opportunity to leave, and chose not to. We must all hurry off the ship before things get worse. Sir Lucan will escort you and see to the evacuation. We must resume our pursuit. For what? So he could talk down this one unnamed rebel soldier? What point was he trying to make here? Yes, the airship is loaded with monsters, and yes, the system has been horribly corrupted by vampires, but there's no need to resort to violence. Have you even tried writing a letter to your local representative? You don't have to do this. The villain's actions are just as baffling. Sir Lucan, Lord Hastings, and all the vampires support Percival's investigation of the rebels. The situation in Whitechapel may need to be addressed. And the only reason the council voted on it was because Lord Hastings suggested it. Perhaps the question should be put to the council. I think this is to show that Hastings has influence over the Order, but the vote doesn't go his way. And why does he even want the Knights to go to Whitechapel? I suppose it benefits him for rebels to be slaughtered, but the rebel hideout had already been cleared out by the werewolves. I suppose Percival and his team found evidence of the assassination plan and thwarted it. That's a win for Hastings. But if he sent them there to find it, does that mean he already knew about the plot? I assume the werewolves work for him, so it's possible they found the evidence first. But he still needed the knights to find the evidence because he couldn't tell anyone how he knew about it. He needed it to be found officially because… because only the knights could have saved his life? Why didn't he just not get on the airship? Sorry, no, I tried. This makes no sense. I give up. Let's talk about gameplay.
The Order is a pretty rudimentary cover-based shooter. The combat is fairly repetitive. You use a variety of assault weapons and special guns to clear out rooms of mostly identical enemies. You're sometimes required to prioritise targets, enemies with their own special guns, or these occasional armoured units that eat hits and do big damage. These can be tricky to deal with, especially if they force you into an area without cover, but can be trivialised by using Black Sight, the Order's bullet time mechanic. However, this is so rarely needed, it's easy to forget when it's actually useful. Aside from the two bosses, there are only three werewolf fights in the entire game, and, to be honest, that's a relief. These encounters play like a game of schoolyard tag. Werewolves charge at you from the shadows, and you either shoot them before they reach you, or receive a nasty swipe before they run away again. I dealt with this by standing in a corner and waiting, which was effective, but a jarring change of pace from the rest of the game's combat. It feels as if they realise too late that cover-based gameplay doesn't really work when your enemies don't have guns. So instead, they made something that kinda worked for the werewolves, featured them as little as possible, and contrived a reason to let you fight people most of the time. But by far the most excruciating part of the game is the obligatory stealth mission, infiltrating United India House. In this section, you are restricted to the use of a crossbow with limited ammo. To progress, you must search the guards for a key, which, of course, means killing them. And the game engineers it so the key is always carried by the very last guard you kill, so you've got your work cut out for you. If you are spotted, it's instant death, and you must repeat the whole thing from the beginning. But this game is not built for stealth. Though the guard AI isn't particularly observant, being behind cover won't fool them, you must actively be in cover. However, the cover mechanics are designed for a firefight and not with spatial awareness in mind. It massively limits your view. Sometimes the only way to check if the coast is clear is to leave cover, and if it's not... Oi, you. So it only adds insult to injury that after completing this mission you are spotted in a scripted animation and your cover is blown anyway. One thing in the game's favour is the visuals. Even five years after release, it still looks damn good, but boy, it doesn't half know it. Separating the combat sections are long walks through beautifully rendered environments. Every object is so carefully designed, the game forces you to spend time admiring the models from every angle, even if there's nothing more to see. You'll be treated to no less than four very impressive werewolf transformations, which is surprising considering how little they actually feature. And so proud is the game of its motion capture work that you'll spend a lot of time performing scripted animations, climbing obstacles, jumping rooftops, searching cupboards, wafting documents around drawers. And I hope you like quick time events because you'll be doing them a lot. I'm not as against them as some people, but it does feel like they're here to paper over some of the cracks. If the final boss fight of your game doesn't involve your core game mechanic, it's probably not working as intended. The plot wants to tell a story of political intrigue and subterfuge, whilst the combat is centred on explosive adrenaline fueled shootouts. It's no wonder Galahad is so bad at maintaining cover, because if he ever succeeded, there'd be nothing for him to do. The story keeps putting him in situations the gameplay isn't designed for, which they then awkwardly jerry-rig into a level that can actually be played with the mechanics they have. It's never great gameplay, but it's made worse by a plot that's not suited for it. And this problem is not limited to narrative and gameplay. Even the world building, the backstory, the aesthetics, all seem to be singing from different hymn sheets. And this goes right down to the very foundation the game is built upon. The Order makes no claims on historical accuracy. It's not even claiming plausibility. I mean, it's got knights, airships, and werewolves. Nevertheless, it does draw clear parallels with reality. Though this London skyline is mostly unrecognisable, Big Ben is there, so is the Thames, the London Underground, the Metropolitan Police, even Queen Victoria, sort of. It even leaves us in no doubt what the date's supposed to be. And, most prominently, it features several characters based on real figures from history. Jack the Ripper is an evil vampire, Nikolai Tesla builds your lightning guns, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is the police commissioner, Charles Darwin is here, he's um, that one. These aren't really allusions to history so much as references to pop culture, which is fine. It doesn't matter, for instance, that Doyle was nothing like his most famous character, but it's fun to reference Sherlock Holmes and that's all it's trying to do. And yet, this is once again plagued by the plot's strange inability to impart crucial information. 
Doyle appears in one scene where nobody refers to him by name. They suggest he's going to be an important character. If you would do us the honour of presenting your findings, you can expect me at Westminster. Then he never shows up again. Do excuse me. The only clue to his identity is some flowery language and that he uses the word elementary. An elementary conjecture. A leap that requires a bit of deductive reasoning. It's as if, through subsequent redrafts, they forgot the player wouldn't already know who this was. Or perhaps they thought this sort of cheeky nod and wink to camera didn't fit with their serious grimdark tone. What is the word the Commissioner is so fond of? Oh yes, elementary. In which case, why make these references at all? Even though these cameos are very clearly not intended to be analogues of their real-world counterparts, their appearance can rub up against history in uncomfortable ways. The main reason Nikolai Tesla is here is to justify the Order's advanced technology, which is okay, fine. But it's a little troubling that among his possessions you can find this flyer for a bawdy house. Nikolai Tesla, famously chased and largely considered to have been asexual by modern standards. The suggestion he might have frequented a brothel is not only incorrect, it's insensitive. Now, in fairness, it's later revealed that Tesla is working with the rebels, who operate out of this brothel, so I assume this is intended to be foreshadowing. But since you don't have the information to make that connection at this point in the plot, the moment still comes across as ignorant queer erasure. Do be careful. Far odder in its treatment of history is the portrayal of your teammate Lafayette. I first assumed this was another code name, but no, this is meant to be the real Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert du Mottier David Diggs Marquis de Lafayette. Revolutionary War, hung out with Washington. Lafayette, street named after him in New York. I get it. Famous hero of two revolutions, the man who fought against the British and staunchly opposed all forms of absolute rule, is here representing the most absolute power in Britain. Um, what? I cannot fathom why, of all the historical figures who might have been relevant to this story, they chose Lafayette. His role in history is alluded to, but never explored. He occasionally makes vague statements about liberté, but that's usually to justify his womanizing. I guess he is French. His presence might have been useful to highlight the alternate history, if America lost the Revolutionary War for instance. But no, his history is left unchanged. Both revolutions still happened. Which means he was at least in his 40s when the Order recruited him. Is the immortality juice a youth potion too? He doesn't even represent the real Lafayette's political outlook. He remains working for the Order the whole game, and while he does express some doubts about their actions, it's in a very centrist way. Two revolutions have taught Lafayette that there are dangers on both sides. For the majority of the game, he does little more than deliver violence with a sort of carefree mirth. We seize the ship in the name of liberty. The fact this is the real Lafayette has no bearing on the plot or themes. Artistic license is all well and good, but what is the point of basing a character on a real person if there's barely any resemblance? I am a lover of liberty, mon ami. Worst of all, though, is the inclusion of Lakshmi Bai as the rebel leader. She's meant to be the Rani of Jhansi, an Indian queen who fought the British and died for Indian independence. Here she's still alive, with her own vial of immortality juice. But this reference lands a little differently than the others. While Lakshmi Bai is an important cultural figure in India, she's not really well known in the West. It's not the same sort of pop culture nod the others are. And yet, like Lafayette, her history is never explored. Her only role in the plot, aside from the nauseating romantic tension during some intense cart pushing, is to convince Galahad of the Order's corruption, displaying an extraordinary amount of patience for this asshole who killed her men. God, your tongue, woman! Your ignorance is not her responsibility, Galahad. Educate yourself. By making her the leader of the rebellion, fighting this world's analogue of the East India Company, the parallel they're trying to draw is obvious. But the game never demonstrates an understanding of Lakshmi Bai beyond what a quick Google might reveal. At best, this reference is just as pointless as the others. At worst, it's appropriative. If these references serve any purpose, collectively, I can only assume it's to add texture to the Victorian aesthetic, seasoning to their steampunk stew. But since the game doesn't make sure the player knows who these people are, or why they're relevant, it seems not to know, or not to care, how it affects the taste. Which brings us to the game's most troubling subject.
So, history isn't what's important here. It's the aesthetic of Victorian London that matters. It's just an excuse to wear fancy clothes, grow fancy facial hair, and talk in fancy language. And I curse to be reminded of his decrepitude by a fair damsel. My lord, this damsel would never be so callous as to do such a thing. That said, it also lifts some of the Victorian era's less fun details. Poverty, class, industry, colonialism, empire. And it doesn't shy away from these subjects either, it depicts them in very explicit terms. Take the Rebellion. Like most rebellions, they are staunchly anti-imperial, and it's not hard to see why. Hideous slums, some no more than crannies of obscure misery. Children work to the bone in the black hell of coal mines, while the captains of industry feast from silver bowls! The game makes sure you know their complaints before you even fight them. They are the underclass. They are impoverished. They are lowborns and immigrants. Their homes are feeding grounds for half-breeds. And their plight is not only ignored by those in power, they are demonized for it. A nest of cut purses, collaborators and whoremongers. Then there's the Bedlamites. The only people lower on the social ladder than the rebels are. They don't represent a particularly sensitive depiction of mental health. The game expects you to kill them without remorse. Let's get rid of this scum. However, the game also goes out of its way to humanize them. It'd be bad enough if they were portrayed as mindless lunatics, but they aren't. They're perfectly cogent. Violent, yes, but organized. They're organized, I know it. I said quiet. This isn't an aimless riot, it's more like a last stand, though the motivations behind it are unclear. Some of the Bedlamites are werewolves, but only a small minority. The rest appear human, and whether their goals are freedom from being institutionalized or simple wanton destruction, they do seem to be motivated by anti-establishment ideals. You think we'll get to shoot a few of them rich folk? I mean, mood. Sir Lucan even suggests the half-breeds are an oppressed race. I do what I must to protect my kind. We fight only for our right to live. And the newspapers littered around the game hint at an angry public, asking all the right questions about this world's power structures. What of due process? What of common law? The Order was born in an age before the signing of the Magna Carta, and their actions reflect it. It is common knowledge the company has acted for years as a shadow government. Were it not for United India's protectors, the gangsters who call themselves Her Majesty's Order of Knights, we would have put pay to their illegal enterprise long ago. Wait, this was common knowledge? Christ, Galahad, don't you read? The game paints a world filled with injustice and inequality, and does so very deliberately. I mean, Chapter 3 is called Inequalities. It's not subtle. So why have they chosen to present this world from the perspective of an Order Knight? The Order is the Empire. Or it might as well be. The Order of Knights calls no one master, not even the Queen. <laughs> They answer to no one, they are bound by no laws, they are free to behave as they wish with impunity. Yet Percival still complains about not having enough freedom. Our order grows too prudent, Grayson. I mean, their base of operations is the Palace of Westminster. What are you supposed to infer from that if not a statement of power? They aren't technically police, but the distinction is trivial. Their mandate is to maintain order using force. The Bedlamites even refer to knights as coppers. <laughs> And the issue of jurisdiction between them and the real police seems no more than an informal agreement. When the knights involve themselves in the Bedlamite escape, with no evidence of half-breed involvement until after the fact, the police are more than happy to follow their orders. Afterward, Commissioner Doyle only mentions jurisdiction as an afterthought, like he's asking for a favour. I'm sure you will appreciate that for the time being, this must remain a police matter. Of course. Percival gives his word with no intention of keeping it, the fact they are able to vote on the issue shows they have no obligation to the police. And after the illegal operation in Whitechapel blows up in spectacular proportion, the only consequences that befall the survivors is a stern telling off. Lord Chancellor, I must- Public buildings destroyed! Innocent citizens placed at risk! This occurs immediately after one of the knights involved is promoted. Then there's this newspaper you can find, which reveals the air support you used in Whitechapel has left several wards without power for days. In October. This isn't mentioned outside this newspaper. The Knights not only fail to accept responsibility, they don't even talk about it. 
The Order claims to defend the British people from half-breeds, but they are entirely unconcerned about how their actions affect the public's well-being. I think the game is attempting some sort of moral complexity by setting its plot against a backdrop of Imperial unrest. In truth, the morality is very straightforward. All of the Order's enemies are victims of injustice, whereas the Order is empowered to defend the system that created that injustice. And I can't for the life of me figure out if the game actually realises this. By the end of the game, Galahad switches sides. He ends up fighting against the Order, so the game must know they're the real bad guys, right? Just because Galahad worked for them initially doesn't mean the game endorses them. What matters is how things are framed. Nice frame. To that end, the game employs a form of framing device by opening with a flash forward. Your first introduction to this world is after Galahad's downfall. The tutorial is Galahad escaping torture in the Order's catacombs. When he takes a hostage to help his escape, the Order guards do not hesitate to fire upon their own man to get to him. Along with all the torture, surely this first impression is intended to colour the player's opinion, conditioning them to regard the Order with suspicion when we flash back. Or were those guards just afraid? They know Galahad by reputation. You're him, aren't you? The convict everyone's talking about. When they shoot, they say they're acting on explicit orders, and the knights Galahad encounters in his escape treat him with concern rather than outright hostility. Don't do this! He's clearly dangerous, and he's here because he's committed some grievous offence. You have betrayed our order! I'm as good as dead already. Galahad! Is the game warning you to distrust the Order, or distrust Galahad? Probably it's both. It wants you to think both of them have valid motivations in this conflict. The framing device seems more about lending the story a sense of foreboding, since the flash forward juxtaposes this fall from grace with Galahad in his prime. But it provides no additional context on Galahad's conflict with the Bedlamites or the Rebels. Alright, but the game clearly knows the Rebels are in the right. By the end, Galahad winds up allied with them. But that's not because he gains a newfound sympathy with their point of view. It's because… vampires. Only when the company turns out to be literal monsters does Galahad regard their actions as monstrous. And even then, he struggles to believe the corruption goes as far as his beloved order, even when the evidence is in front of his eyes. You saw on the docks how your own ranks have been infiltrated. If it is as you say, then surely I would The war suspect. has turned against the half-breeds. From the very beginning, Galahad, and all the knights, are well aware of the rebels' grievances, but they barely give it much thought. Look, monsieur. God did not save this queen. Galahad still doesn't consider it after he defects. The rebels' stance on imperialism doesn't come up again, to the point it's not clear if that's still their primary motivation. It's also not clear if Galahad has officially joined the rebellion by the end. Lakshmi Bai leaves London, whereas it's implied Galahad remains to fight the corruption. Their alliance only ever mattered when it served Galahad's own interests. I'm a knight, sworn to protect the realm, not bring it crashing down. Galahad could expose the corruption by revealing Lucan as a half-breed, but he doesn't. Instead, he kills Lucan to keep the secret. As a result, Lord Hastings goes free, with the Order still under his thumb and no rebellion left to challenge him. Why does Galahad do this? Why does he continue to defend the Order after they've already disowned him? The revelation would shake our Order to its very foundations. The Council must never discover the truth, lest all you hold dear perish. The Order is the Empire. The Empire is society and Galahad cannot conceive any form of society can exist without the Order. Martial rule isn't the problem, these are just bad martial rulers. Corporate greed isn't the problem, this is just a bad corporation. Super soldiers who attack their own people are not the problem. The vampires made him do it. A protagonist doesn't need to represent the moral centre of their story. We can tell stories about bad people doing bad things for bad reasons. In video games, however, this can be trickier to pull off. It's one thing to invite an audience to observe questionable ethics, inviting them to participate 
is quite another. The easiest solution is to make the conflict very simple. Your enemies are mindless monsters or enemy soldiers. Or Nazis, which are both. You're in a kill or be killed situation where there's no room for negotiation. On the other hand, games that explore more complex ethics tend to allow players to justify their own actions. By incorporating choice into the narrative, or including non-lethal alternatives in the gameplay, violence may be avoidable. In this case, when players kill people, it's because they themselves deem it the correct choice, or the choice of the character they are performing within the fiction. It's rare for a game to force a player to kill people whom the narrative frames as morally superior. Grand Theft Auto may make sport of mowing down rows of pedestrians, but the tone is obvious parody, and the only people the narrative requires you to kill are other criminals or law enforcement. Shadow of the Colossus requires you to kill monsters for heroic reasons, but encourages you to reflect on your violence when the monsters seem less mindlessly hostile and more afraid of you. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 caused controversy with a mission which forced the player to take part in massacring unarmed civilians, but even then it gave the option to skip the mission entirely unless you promised not to be offended. Video games as a medium may not always be the most sophisticated in their representations of violence, but they do at least recognise the need to address the ethics of combat in some way. The Order recognises this too, otherwise it wouldn't discuss it so much. We may be pursuing Bedlamites, but they remain civilians. Use non-lethal force whenever possible. We are without sanction here. The Lord Chancellor will be most displeased. Remember, stealth mode. They keep bandying around terms like non-lethal force, but there isn't a non-lethal option. Even in the stealth mission, you cannot progress until you've killed everyone there. The game continually questions whether violence is warranted, and then shrugs it off as the ends justifying any means. I think it's unwise to eliminate company guards until we have proof. There is no time, Alistair. This is the only way. Frequently, your actions are framed as a response to the violence of your enemies. The Bedlamites, the Agamemnon guards, the rebels in Whitechapel and on Westminster Bridge all shoot first. The knights are simply retaliating. This seems like a considered choice, to paint your enemies as the aggressors. But for a knight, simply being there is an act of violence. All of these missions are outside your alleged jurisdiction. In half of them, you're literally trespassing. And it only takes the actions of one person for the knights to condemn an entire group to death. You can't walk into somebody's house with a gun in your hand and act surprised when they try to defend themselves. And a fun governor. At ease, monsieur. Then there's the tricky business of killing people who will later become your allies. Or, at least, the survivors will. This is a tricky ethical tightrope to walk, because if you want your player to engage in an action that will prove to be the wrong one, you need to convince them it's right at the time. Other games manage this by misleading the player about their enemy's intentions. In Guild Wars, you hunt the Shining Blade because you're told they're kidnappers, but when confronted, they turn out to be liberators. In Halo, you help Guilty Spark to stop the flood spreading, but only because he neglects to mention helping him would kill all sentient life in the universe. Left out that little detail, did he? The Order might be trying to do something like this. Galahad switches sides when he learns the Rebels aren't targeting Lord Hastings because they're anti-Imperial, but because they're anti-Vampire. Does this mean the game expects us to consider their actions punishable by death before this point? I don't think so. As we've already discussed, the Rebels' hardships are depicted very acutely, whereas Galahad is never portrayed with any particular zeal for Empire. Unless… the game just treats it as a given that any anti-establishment resistance is always bad, no matter the reason. You don't have to do this. No, I can't really believe they're saying challenging authority is a capital offence, with vampires as the only exception. But if it's not presenting the murder of rebels as justified, even deceptively so, what exactly is it expecting the player to think about it? Are we supposed to accept these are simply Galahad's actions, which we, the player, are merely performing? There are games where you're meant to play as the bad guy, but those games tend to establish what motivates the player character to do bad things, whether it's revenge, world domination, or the simple joy of senseless evil. <coughs> But as we've already seen, Galahad's motivations aren't explored. We don't know why he became a knight. He shows no interest one way or the other in the rebels' anti-imperialist rhetoric. He never even apologises for killing them after he changes sides. He's just… some guy doing his job. 
Okay, let's be honest. The real reason the game doesn't bother to justify the violence is because they didn't think about it. I feel like some game developers believe that because combat is fun, players don't need a reason to do it. Story is just a thing you have to sit through in order to get to the good stuff. Shooting pixels on a screen is the same, whether they're soldiers or aliens or abstract shapes. When the game begins and tells you to murder escaped mental patients, it doesn't expect you to question your orders. It assumes you'll enjoy it as much as Galahad does. Everything to your liking thus far? Quite. Just another ordinary London morning. Indeed. Although I do hope that was only the beginning. So Galahad's a psychopath. Because the game believes the player is one too. Or, more accurately, Galahad cares about the people he kills as little as the game believes the player cares about fictional people who were invented to be killed. It's only a game, don't worry about it. But just because it's avoided thinking about the violence it portrays doesn't mean it's avoided saying something about it. I don't believe The Order 1886 genuinely intends to advocate for a team of super-powered police with the freedom to decide who lives and who dies. But in a clumsy, unclear way, that's basically what it's doing. They wanted to tell a story about inequality and injustice, but didn't want to take a strong stance on the subjects they'd raised. And yet, there is one thing they take a very clear stance on. Gender. There are female knights. Galahad's teammate Isabeau is portrayed as highly capable and very strong-willed. It's unfortunate, then, that they stumble headfirst into every other disappointing trope. She's a hashtag girl boss who don't need no man. Sure you don't need help, love. Do you mean a strong man to take control of things? Just stay out of our way. Yet the men in her life still treat her as fragile. No, I'm coming with you. Izzy, you need to find Lafayette and get off this ship. I... Your brother charged me to bring you back safely. But they're trying. Despite her flaws, Isabeau does at least have more to her character than just being the girl of the group. She's Galahad's former mentee, who believes she's surpassed him. Admittedly, she's treated a bit like a romantic interest, but it's unfulfilled because of their fidelity vows. There's some interesting stuff here. There aren't many speaking female characters, and what few there are are not particularly well written. But they are all highly motivated, and the male characters don't question it. Much. No man in the realm can keep Isabeau from danger when she's of a mind. And the game just about passes the Bechdel test. I half suspect that's the only reason Devi's in the plot at all. Devi, though you may not trust Jesus me. Galahad, you're not a part of this conversation. I wouldn't call it good representation. Oh! Hello? But it is at least clear what they're attempting to say. Women have a seat at the table. Which only makes it all the more obvious when they fail to take a stance. Why draw parallels to colonial history without condemning colonialism? Why spell out the rebels' arguments yet fail to have your lead characters take part in the discussion? Why make the effort to highlight gender representation yet present other forms of injustice without comment? Gender is something that video games have received a lot of scrutiny for in the past decade. Poor representation of women is still rampant, but it's something the industry at large has become more conscious of. More developers realise it's a bad look. It can lead to bad press. So it doesn't surprise me that the Order felt the need to address it. However, taking a stance on an issue runs the risk of alienating a portion of your potential audience. At worst, it might incur the wrath of gaming's most toxic elements, the straight white male gamers who believe the medium exists for them and them alone. Thus, it has become worryingly common for game developers to claim their games are not political. In no way do we aspire to be a political game. We have no political motivations whatsoever. I didn't want to deliver a message to mankind with this game. I just want to ask questions. In Battlefield 5, we're not making any political statements in relation to the real-life events of World War II. I don't want people to think this is a really hard, politically charged game. But of course they're political. These are games about war, racism, history, capitalism. You cannot depoliticize these subjects. Yet that's exactly what it feels like the Order is trying to do. Don't put me in shining armor, ask me to shoot people dressed in rags, and tell me this isn't political. 
You can't present a conflict between the British Empire and a rebellious underclass without saying something about that. I don't mean you shouldn't, although, yeah, you shouldn't. I mean you literally can't. By making decisions about how you interpret, portray, and frame a subject, you have said something about it. Even failing to take a stance is itself a stance. So while the Order may think it's managed to avoid politics, instead it's barreled head first into an abhorrent political philosophy it never intended. By painting an unjust world whilst also discouraging the player from examining it, they are saying it's unnecessary to examine injustice. By confronting their hero with his own ignorance without requiring him to address that ignorance, they are saying he was in the right even when he was wrong. By creating a police force of well-armed superheroes and having them fight morally complex humans fighting for basic human rights, they are saying those in power are entitled to massacre whomever they wish. Which, to me, is a pretty damn political thing to say. Back when the Order was released in 2015, the reviews mainly criticised it for being too short or too generic, that it was more style than substance, which is true enough, but aside from a few remarks about the cavalier attitude to killing, most of the reviews I've seen didn't focus on the portrayal of violence or injustice. Since then, there's been the occasional think piece about how, despite the game's flaws, the IP had enough potential to warrant a sequel. And in January of 2020, rumours of a sequel were once again stoked after a post on NeoGAF described a trailer. This sequel will, allegedly, be released on PlayStation 5 and will look really, really good. No surprises there. But if there is a sequel, to be released in a post-2020 world, I sincerely hope developers Ready at Dawn have done at least a bit of thinking about the way they handle police violence. Because... I suspect they won't get away with it so easily a second time. 